Chapter Nine, Part Two of the Mysteries of Paris, Volume Five by Eugène Sue. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lion's Den, Part Two. An uproarious noise made by the prisoners in the yard interrupted the skeleton's counsel. Nicolas rose hastily and went to the door of the room to discover the cause of this unusual tumult. It is the Gros Boiteux said nicolas returning the gros boiteux exclaimed the prévôt and has germain come down from the visiting-room not yet replied barbillon then let him make haste said the skeleton and i'll give him an order for a new coffin the gros boiteux whose arrival was so warmly hailed by the prisoners in the lion's den and whose information might be so fatal to germain was a man of middle stature but in spite of being fat and crippled he was nimble and vigorous his countenance brutal like that of most of his companions was of the bulldog character his low forehead his small yellow eyes his flaccid cheeks his heavy jaws the lower being very projecting and armed with long teeth or rather broken fangs which in places projected beyond his lips made his resemblance to that animal the more striking he wore a felt cap and over his clothes a blue cloak with a fur collar the gros boiteux was accompanied into the prison by a man about thirty years of age whose tanned and freckled face appeared less dissolute than that of the other prisoners although he affected to appear as dogged as his companion from time to time his features became overcast and he smiled bitterly the gros boiteux soon found himself amongst his boon companions and acquaintances and he could scarcely reply to the congratulations and kind words which came to him from all sides what is it you old boy all right now we shall have some fun you haven't hurried yourself still i have done all i could to see my friends again as soon as possible and it was no fault of mine if the stone jug didn't claim me sooner don't doubt you old boy and a man doesn't pick out a jail as his favourite residence but once trapped he does his best to be jolly and so we shall be for pic vinaigre is here is he what one of the old customers of melon why that's capital for he'll help us to pass the time with his stories and his customers will not fail him for there are more recruits coming in who are they why just now at the entrance whilst i came in i saw two fresh chaps brought in one i didn't know but the other who wore a blue cotton cap and a grey blouse i have seen before somewhere he is a powerful-looking man and i think i have met him at the ogresses of the white rabbit i say gros boiteux don't you remember at melun i bet you a wager that in less than a year you would be nabbed again to be sure i do and you've won but what are you here for oh i was caught on the prigging lay had i made again ah always in the same line yes i continue in my usual small way the rig is common but there are always culls and but for the stupidity of a pal i should not be here however once caught twice warned and when i begin again i will be more careful i have my plan ah here's cardillac said the boiteux going to a little man wretchedly dressed with ill-looking aspect full of craft and malignity and with features partaking of the wolf and fox ah old chap how are you ah old limper replied the prisoner nicknamed cardillac to the gros boiteux they said every day he's coming he's not coming but you are like the pretty girls you do as you like yes to be sure well replied cardillac is it for something spicy that you are here now yes my dear fellow i had done one or two good things but the last was a failure it was an out-and-out -out go and may still be done unfortunately frank and i overshot the mark and the gros boiteux pointed to his companion towards whom all eyes now turned ah so it is it's frank said cardillac i didn't know him again because of his beard what frankie why i thought you'd turned honest and was at least mayor of your village i was an ass and i've suffered for it said frank quickly but every sin has its repentance i was good once and now i'm a prig for the rest of my days let em look out when i get out 
what happened to you frank what happens to every free convict who is donkey enough to think he can turn honest fate is just when i left melun i'd saved nine hundred and odd francs yes that's true said the gros boiteux all his misfortunes have come from his keeping his savings instead of spending em jolly when he left the jug you see what repentance leads to they sent me en surveillance to etampes replied frank being a locksmith by trade i went to a master in my line and said to him i am a freed convict i know no one likes to employ such but here are nine hundred francs of my savings give me work my money will be your guarantee for i want to work and be honest what a joke well you'll see how it answered i offered my savings as a guarantee to the master locksmith that he might give me work i'm not a banker to take money on interest says he to me and i don't want any freed convicts in my shop i go to work in houses to open doors where keys are lost i have a confidential business and if it were known that i employed a freed convict amongst my workmen i should lose my customers good day my man wasn't that just what he deserved cardillac exactly you simpleton said the gros boiteux to frank with a paternal air instead of breaking your ban at once and coming to paris to melt your mopuses so that you might not have a sou left but be compelled to return to robbing you see the end of your fine ideas that's what you're always saying said frank with impatience it is true i was wrong not to spend my tin for i have not even enjoyed it well as there were only four locksmiths in the temp he whom i had first addressed had soon told all the others and they said to me as had said their fellow tradesmen no thank ye all sung the same song only see now what it all comes to you must see that we are all marked for life well then i was on the idol of etampes and my money melted and melted continued frank but no work came i left etampes in spite of my surveillance and came to paris where i found work immediately for my employer did not know who or what i was and it's no boast to say i am a first-rate workman well i put my seven hundred francs which i had remaining into an agent's hands who gave me a note for it when that was due he did not pay me so i took my note to a huissier who brought an action against him and recovered the money which i left in his hands saying to myself there's something for a rainy day well just then i met the gros boiteux true well frank was a locksmith and made keys i had a job in which he could be of service and i proposed it to him i had the prince and he had only to go to work when only imagine he refused he meant to turn honest so says i i'll arrange about that i'll make him work for his own interest so i wrote a letter without any signature to his master and another to his fellow workmen to inform them that frank was a liberated convict so the master turned him away he went to another employer and worked there for a week same game again and if he had gone to a dozen i'd have served him in the same way and if i had suspected that it was you who had informed against me answered frank i'd have given you a pleasant quarter of an hour to pass well i was at length driven away from my last employer as a scamp only fit to be hanged work then be respectable so that people may say not what are you doing but what have you done once on the pave i said fortunately i have my savings to fall back upon so i went to the huissier but he had cut his stick and spent my tin and here was i without a feather to fly with not even enough to pay for a week's lodging what a precious rage i was in well at this moment comes the gros boiteux and he took advantage of my situation i saw it was useless trying to be honest and that once on the prig there's no leaving it but old gros i owe you a turn come frank no malice replied the gros boiteux well he did his part like a man and we entered upon the business which promised royally but unfortunately at the moment when we opened our mouths to swallow the dainty bit the traps were down upon us couldn't be helped you know lad if it wasn't for that why our profession would be too good 
yet if that vagabond of a huissier had not robbed me i should not have been here said frank with concentrated rage well well continued the gros boiteux do you mean to say that you were better off when you were breaking your back with work i was free retorted frank yes on sundays and when you were out of work but the rest of the week you were tied up like a dog and never sure of employ why you don't know when you are well off will you teach me said frank bitterly well you've a right to be vexed for it was shameful to miss such a good stroke but it is still to be done in a month or two the people will become reassured and it is a rich very rich house i shall be sentenced for breaking my ban and so cannot resume the job but if i find an amateur i will hand it over to him a bargain my woman has the prince and there is nothing to do but make new keys and with the information i can give it must succeed why there must be at least four hundred livres to lay hands on and that ought to console you frank frank shook his head crossed his hands over his chest and made no reply cardillac took the gros boiteux by the arms led him into a corner of the yard and said to him after a moment's silence is the affair you have failed in still good in two months as good as new can you prove it of course and what do you ask for it a hundred francs as earnest and i will give you the word arranged with my woman on which she will hand you the prince from which you can make the false keys and moreover if the thing comes off i shall expect a fifth share of the swag to be handed over to my woman that's not unreasonable as i shall know to whom she has given the prince if i am done out of my share i shall know whom to inform against and very right too if you were choused but amongst prigs and cracksmen there's honour we must rely on each other or all business would be impossible another anomaly in this horrid existence this villain spoke the truth it is very seldom that thieves fail in their faith in such arrangements as these but they usually act with a kind of good faith or rather that we may not prostitute the word we will say that necessity compels these ruffians to keep their words for if they failed as the companion of the gros boiteux said all business would be impossible a great number of robberies are arranged bought and plotted in this way in jail another pernicious result of confinement in common if what you say is sure continued cardillac i can agree for the job there are no proofs against me i am sure to be acquitted and in a fortnight i shall be out let us add three weeks in order to turn oneself about to get the false keys and lay our plans and then in six weeks from this you'll go to the job in the very nick of time well then it's a bargain but how about the earnest i must have something down here is my last button and when i have no more yet there are others left said cardillac tearing off a button covered with cloth from his ragged blue coat and then tearing off the covering with his nails he showed the gros boiteux that instead of a button mould it contained a piece of forty francs you see i can pay deposit he added when the affair is arranged that's the ticket old fellow said the gros boiteux and as you are soon going out and have got rhino to work with i can put you up to another thing a real good go the cheese a regular affair which my woman and myself have been cooking up and which only wants the finishing stroke only imagine a lone street in a deserted quarter a ground floor looking on one side into an obscure alley and on the other a garden and here two old people who go to roost with the cocks and hens since the riots and for fear of being robbed they have concealed behind a panel in a pot of preserves a quantity of gold my woman found it out by gossiping with the servant but i tell you this will be a dearer job than t'other for it is in hard cash and all cooked ready to eat and drink we'll arrange it be assured but you haven't worked over well since you left the central yes i have had a pretty fair chance i got together some trifles which brought me nearly sixty pounds one of my best bites was a pull at two women who lodged in the same house with me in the passage de la brasserie what a daddy micou's yes and your josephine just the same 
a real ferret as ever she cooks with the old couple i have mentioned to you and so smelt out the pot with the golden honey in it she's nothing but a trump i flatter myself she is but talking of trumps you know the chouette yes nicolas has told me the schoolmaster did for her and he has gone mad perhaps from losing his sight through some accident but i say old fellow it's quite understood that you will buy my two bargains and so i shall not speak to any one else don't and we will talk them over this evening well and how are you getting on here oh we laugh and play the fool who's prevot of the chamber the skeleton he's not to be joked with i have seen him at martial's in the ile du ravageur we had a flare-up with josephine and la boulotte by the way nicolas is here so micou told me when he made a lament that nicolas was putting the screw on an old hunks why what else were receivers made for here is the skeleton said cardillac as the prévôt appeared at the door of the room young un come forward said the skeleton to the gros boiteux here i am he replied going into the apartment accompanied by frank whose arm he held during the conversation between the gros boiteux frank and cardillac berbillon had been by order of the prévôt to select twelve or fifteen of the choicest prisoners who in order to avoid the suspicions of the turnkey had come separately into the day-room the other detenus had remained in the yard and some of them by barbillon's advice had appeared to be disputing in order to take off the attention of the turnkey from the room in which were now assembled the skeleton barbillon nicolas frank cardillac the gros boiteux and some fifteen other prisoners all awaiting with impatient curiosity until the prévôt should open the business barbillon charged with the lookout placed himself near the door the skeleton taking his pipe from his mouth said to the gros boiteux do you know a slim young man named germain with blue eyes brown hair and the look of a noodle what is germain here inquired the gros boiteux with surprise hate and anger in his looks what then you know him said the skeleton know him replied the gros boiteux why my lads i denounce him as a nose and he must be punished yes yes replied the prisoners are you sure it was he who informed against you asked frank suppose it was a mistake we mustn't ill-use a man who's innocent this remark was displeasing to the skeleton who leaned over to gros boiteux and said in his ear who is this man one with whom i have worked are you sure yes but he hasn't gull enough too much trickle in him good i'll keep an eye on him tell us how germain turned nose said a prisoner yes let us know all about it gros boiteux continued the skeleton who did not take his eyes off frank well then said gros boiteux a man of nantes named velu a freed convict brought up the young fellow whose birth no one is acquainted with when he had reached the proper age they put him into a banking-house at nantes thinking they had put a wolf to watch the money-box and make use of germain to do a bold and great stroke which had been meditated for a very long time there were to be two coups a forgery and a dip into the strong chest at the bank something like a hundred and fifty thousand francs all was arranged and the velu relied on the young fellow as on himself for the chap slept in the room in which the iron safe was velu told him his plans germain neither says yes or no but reveals all to his employer and the very same evening cuts his stick and missiles to paris the prisoners burst into various murmurs of indignation and threats he's a spy knows informer and will have the bones out of his body if it's agreeable i'll seek a quarrel with him and settle his hash silence in the stone jug exclaimed the skeleton in a tone of command the prisoners were silent go on said the prévôt to gros boiteux and he went on smoking believing that germain had consented and relying on his assistance velu and two of his friends attempted the job that same night the banker was on the watch one of velu's friends was taken as he was entering a window he himself escaping with difficulty 
he reached paris enraged at having been sold by germain and foiled in a splendid affair one fine day he met the young fellow it was in the open daylight and he didn't dare do anything but he followed him found out where he lived and one night we two velu and little ledru fell on germain unfortunately he escaped and then changed his residence in the rue du temple where he lived we were unable to find him afterwards but if he is here i demand you have nothing to demand said the skeleton in a tone of authority the gros was instantly silent i take the bargain off your hands you will concede to me germain's skin and i'll flay him alive i am not called the skeleton for nothing i am dead alive my grave is dug and i run no risk in working for the stone jug the informers destroy us faster than the police they put noses of la fosse into la roquette and the noses of la roquette in the conciergerie and they think themselves safe now mind you when each prison shall have killed its informer no matter when he may have informed that will take away the other's appetite i will set the example and let others follow it all the prisoners admiring the skeleton's resolution closed around him Barbillon himself instead of remaining near the door joined the group and did not perceive another prisoner who had entered the room this individual clothed in a grey blouse and wearing a blue cotton cap with a red worsted border pulled down over his eyes started as he heard the name of germain mentioned and then mingling with the skeleton's admirers gave out loud tones of approbation at the deadly determination of the prévôt what an out and outer the skeleton is said one the devil himself is a fool to him this here's what i call a man if all were like him wouldn't the flats be afeard he'll do a real service to the stone jug and when they see this the noses will look blue and no mistake and since the skeleton is safe to suffer why it'll cost him nothing to put a nose out of joint well i think it's too bad said frank to kill the young chap why why exclaimed the skeleton in a savage tone no one has a right to protect a traitor yes to be sure he is a traitor so much the worse for him said frank after a moment's reflection these latter words and gros Boiteux's assurance put the doubts which the other prisoners had entertained against frank to rest the skeleton alone continued to mistrust him and what are we to do with the turnkey tell us dead alive for that is your name as well as the skeleton said nicolas with a grin we must draw off his attention somehow no we'll hold him down by main force yes no silence in the stone jug said the skeleton there was complete silence listen to me said the prevot in his hoarse voice there is no means of doing the thing so long as the turnkey remains in the day-room or the walking-yard i have no knife and there must be a few groans for the sneak will struggle well what then why this pic vinaigre has promised to tell us to-day after dinner his story of gringalet and cut in half it rains and we shall all come here and the sneak will come and sit down there in the corner as he always does we'll give pic vinaigre some sou that he may begin his tale it will be dinner-time in the jail the turnkey will see us quietly employed in listening to the miraculous mystery of gringalet and cut in half and will suspecting no harm make off to the tap as soon as he has left the yard we shall have a quarter of an hour to ourselves and the nose will be cold meat before the turnkey can return i will undertake it i who have done for stouter fellows in my day in mine i'll have no assistance mind your eye cried cardillac and what about the huissier who will always come for a gossip amongst us at dinner-time if he comes into the room to listen to pic vinaigre and sees germain done for he will cry out for help he's not one of us the huissier he's in a private cell and we should mistrust him is there a huissier here said frank the victim as we know of a breach of trust by maître boulard is there a huissier here he repeated with astonishment and what is his name boulard replied cardillac 
the very man the identical villain cried frank clenching his fist it is he who has stolen my savings the huissier inquired the prévôt yes seven hundred francs of mine you know him and has he seen you inquired the skeleton i have seen him worse luck but for him i should not be here these regrets sounded ill in the skeleton's ears and he fixed his malignant eyes steadfastly on frank who replied to several of his comrades questions then stooping towards the gros boiteux he said in a low voice this is a freshen who might tell the turnkey no i'll answer for his not informing against any one yet still he has his scruples about going the whole hog and he might aid germain in defending himself it would be best to get him out of the yard i'll do it said the skeleton and then aloud he said i say frank won't you pitch into this thief of a lawyer won't i that's all well he's coming and so look out i'm ready and he shall bear my marks we shall have a row and they will send the receipt to his room and frank to the black hole said the skeleton in an undertone to the coboiteux we shall thus get rid of both what a lucky pitch why this skeleton is a prime minister said the boiteux admiringly and then he added in a loud tone i say shall we tell pic vinaigre that we shall avail ourselves of his history to come over the turnkey and throttle the sneak by no means pic vinaigre is too soft and too cowardly if he was up to the thing he wouldn't tell the story but when the job is done and over he'll bear his share the dinner bell sounded at this moment to your puddings dogs said the skeleton pic vinaigre and germain will soon be in the yard now mind your eyes boys they call me dead alive but the sneak is also dead alive end of chapter nine read by celine major chapter ten of the mysteries of paris volume five by eugene sue this librivox recording is in the public domain the storyteller the new prisoner of whom we have spoken and who was dressed in a grey blouse with a cotton cap on his head had attentively listened to and energetically applauded the scheme for punishing the reserve of germain even at the expense of his life this individual whose form betokened strength and power of no ordinary description quitted the day-room with the rest of the prisoners without being noticed and soon mingled with the different groups assembled in the courtyard to receive their rations crowding around the persons employed in the distribution like so many hungry cormorants each prisoner received a piece of the meat employed in making the day's soup with about half a loaf of tolerably good bread such of the detenus as possessed the means were allowed to purchase drink at the wine-shop belonging to the prison and even to go thither to regale themselves with their lush while persons who like nicolas had received provisions from their friends generally made a sort of feast to which they invited their most intimate acquaintances the guests selected by the son of the executed felon upon the present occasion were the skeleton barbillon and at the suggestion of the latter pic vinaigre in order that good eating and drinking might quicken his talent for story-telling the ham hard-boiled eggs cheese and delicate white bread wrung from the forced generosity of micou the receiver were arranged most temptingly on a bench in the day-room and the skeleton prepared himself to do ample justice to the repast without in the slightest degree disturbing his appetite by the thoughts of the cold-blooded murder that was to follow it just go and see whether pic vinaigre is coming will you my fine fellow cried he addressing an individual who stood near him i tell you what it is while i'm waiting to choke that stuck-up young fool they call germain i'm blowed if hunger and thirst won't choke me if i have to dawdle about much longer and here don't forget to work old frank up to do for the bum bailiff so that we may kill two birds with one stone as the saying is don't you be afraid old dead alive if frank don't make a stiffen of the bailey it won't be our fault that you may take your oath of and while uttering these words nicolas went forth from the day-room at this moment maitre boulard entered the yard smoking a cigar his hands buried in the pockets of his grey duffel dressing-gown his peaked cap pulled down well over his ears and a look of chuckling satisfaction upon his fat full-blown countenance he quickly espied nicolas who was busily occupied gazing around in search of frank 
that person was at that precise period of time busily occupied in company with his friend gros boiteux in eating his dinner and from the position in which they sat on one of the benches they perceived not the presence of the bailiff acting in implicit obedience of the directions given him by the skeleton directly nicolas from the corner of his eye descried the approach of maitre boulard he feigned entire ignorance of his vicinity but made for the place where frank and his companions were seated how are you my ticket inquired the bailiff of nicolas bless me answered he i declare i didn't see you i suppose you're like me come out to take a sniff of fresh air and have your daily walk why that's about it but i happen to have more reasons than one to-day and i tell you how it is but first of all catch hold of one of these cigars they're deuced good ones come don't be so missy and shy about it take as many as you like hang it all when men are shut up together in a place like this they oughtn't to be stingy you are very good and so are your cigars but you were saying you had several reasons for walking out to-day well and so i have first and foremost i don't feel as hungry as usual so thinks i i'll go and look on while those chaps eat their dinner who knows but the sight of their jaws all working away together may screw me up a bit and give me a relish against feeding time a famous idea said nicolas but if you really want to see a couple of feeders just draw this way there added he pointing to the bench on which frank was sitting what do you think of a pair of grubbers like those i should say we were better behind than before them or they might even swallow us instead of those huge lumps of bread and cheese and onions so rapidly stowed away in their capacious jaws let's have a look at them said maitre boulard well to be sure cried nicolas with feigned surprise i declare one of them is gros boiteux gros boiteux and frank both turned around at these words stupefied and speechless the bailiff continued to gaze in utter amazement at the man he had so wronged while starting up with a sudden spring frank threw down the morsel he had been eating and darting on maitre boulard he seized him by the throat exclaiming my money my money give me my money hello who are you what do you mean hands off or you'll strangle me i my money i say my good man only calm yourself and listen to reason no not till you give me back my money what aren't you satisfied with having brought me here can you not restore me what you stole from me but i-i-i never i tell you again if i get sent to the galleys tis all along of you for had you not taken my little all from me i should not have been driven to the necessity of robbing others i might have lived and died an honest man you may be acquitted you may escape the punishment you deserve but at least you shall carry my marks away with you ha ha you can come it grand and swagger about here dressed up with your gold chains and trinkets but no doubt with the money of other poor devils who have been cheated by you as i have been take that for your pains and that that and that now have you had enough no then here's for you again help help screamed the bailiff as he rolled on the ground at frank's feet while his infuriated antagonist continued to belabour him with all his force the rest of the prisoners took little or no interest in this affray but contented themselves with forming a circle around the two combatants or rather the assailant and the assailed for maitre boulard frightened and out of breath made not the slightest resistance but contented himself with warding off his adversary's blows as well as he could fortunately the repeated cries of the poor maltreated bailiff reached the ears of one of the superintending officers by whose intervention he was rescued from the rough hands of frank pale terrified and almost speechless with terror maitre boulard arose one eye was wholly closed by the severe beating he had received and without giving himself time to pick up his cap he wildly cried as he rushed towards the officer open the door let me out let me out i can't and i won't stay here another minute help here help help as for you exclaimed the officer grasping frank by the collar do you come along with me before the governor i know you'll catch it too for fighting two days in the black hole is the very least you'll get i promise you i've paid him off at any rate returned frank and i don't care for the rest i say 
whispered gros boiteux while affecting to be merely helping to arrange his dress i say you won't breathe a word of what's going to happen to the sneak of course oh don't be afraid tis just likely had i been by i might have stood up in his defence because to kill a man in that manner is hard at least and for such a trifle but as for telling of it or betraying you all oh no now then called out the officer i say are you coming or are you not that's all right said nicolas we've got well rid of frank and the bailiff now let's go to work without further loss of time upon the sneak as frank was being led from the prison-yard germain and pique vinaigre entered it it was scarcely possible to recognize germain for his hitherto melancholy and dejected countenance was radiant with joy and an exulting happiness he walked proudly erect casting around him a look of certain and assured content he knew himself to be beloved and with that consciousness all the horrors of his prison seemed to disappear pique vinaigre followed him with a timid confused air and after much hesitation at length plucked up sufficient courage to venture to address germain whose arm he gently touched ere the intended victim had reached the group of prisoners who from a distance were examining him with looks of deadly hatred spite of himself germain shuddered at thus being brought into contact with a person of pique vinaigre's appearance whose wretched person and ragged attire were ill calculated to impress any one with a favourable opinion of him but recollecting the earnest advice of rigolette and feeling altogether too happy himself to act with any want of benevolence germain stopped and said to pique vinaigre in a gentle tone of voice what do you want with me my friend i want to thank you for what for the kindness shown to my sister by the pretty young woman who visited you to-day i really do not understand you said germain much surprised well then i'll try and make you just now when i was in the lodge of the prison i saw the man who was on duty in the visitor's room a little while ago ah yes a very good-hearted sort of man too i recollect him well it is not often you can apply that term to the jailers of a prison but the man i mean roussel is his name is really deserving of being styled a kind good-hearted man so all of a sudden he whispers in my ear i say pique vinaigre my lad he says do you know monsieur germain yes says i i do says i he's the bête noire of the prison yard then suddenly interrupting himself pique vinaigre said to germain i beg your pardon for calling you a bête noire don't think anything of that but listen to the end of my story oh i'm listening go on yes says i i know who you mean very well says i you mean monsieur germain the bait noir of the prison-yard and of you too i suppose said the officer in a severe and serious manner oh bless you says i i am too good-natured as well as too much of a coward to venture to call any one disagreeable and less monsieur germain than any one else says i for i don't see any harm in him and other folks appear to me very cruel and unjust towards him that's all right then answers the officer and i can tell you that you are bound to side with monsieur germain for he has been very kind to you he says to me says i how do you mean well he answers i don't mean monsieur germain exactly and it ain't to you altogether he's been kind but still for all that says roussel you are bound to show him your gratitude try said germain smilingly and make me understand what it is you do mean that's precisely what i said to the officer speak more clearly i says so then he makes an answer why it was not monsieur germain but the very pretty young person that was here just now to see him who loaded your sister with all sorts of kindnesses she overheard the poor thing telling you all her troubles and directly as the creature went out the charming young woman has come visiting to monsieur germain went and offered to serve her in every way she could dear good rigolette murmured germain deeply affected by this little incident she said not one word to me of all this well to be sure i says to the officer what a poor stupid goose i am you are quite right you are monsieur germain leastways his friend has been good to me that is to say to my sister jeanne which is the same thing only much more than if the favour had been done to myself poor dear rigolette said germain ever the same tender compassionate generous-hearted creature 
so then the officer goes on to say how he heard all that passed between your nice young woman and my poor sister jeanne and now he says pique vinaigre that you are aware of the fact if you don't try to show kindness by every means in your power to monsieur germain and more especially if you should know of any plot got up against him and not warn him of it why he says pique vinaigre you would be a regular scamp and a blackguard i tell you what i makes answer and says i'm an unfinished scamp as yet but i'm no blackguard and what's more i never will be worse than i am for the sake of my poor dear jeanne and her children and so because m germain's friend has taken notice of my jeanne who is one of the best and worthiest creatures that ever lived i may venture to boast of my sister though i am ashamed of myself but for that reason i will do all in my power to save or serve m germain unfortunately i can do but little after all never mind do your best that is all i ask of you but i will give you the pleasure of being the pleasing bearer of news to m germain which indeed i have only just learned myself what is it inquired germain that to-morrow morning there will be a vacant chamber you can have for paying for then you will be all by yourself the officer desired me to tell you so indeed exclaimed germain how truly glad i am to hear it that worthy man was right in saying you would be the bearer of pleasant news well i do think so myself for it is quite easy to perceive that you do not feel comfortable among such poor wretches as we are then suddenly breaking off pigvinaigre hastily added in a low whisper while feigning to stoop as though searching for something he had dropped hark ye monsieur germain the prisoners are all looking at us wondering what we are talking about i must go but be on your guard and if any one tries to quarrel with you don't make any answer they want a pretext for all attacking you at once barbillon is the one chosen to provoke you so take especial care of him i will try and turn the attention of the others from being directed towards you in a spiteful manner and with these words pique vinaigre rose up from his stooping position with the air of one who had found the object of his search thanks my good fellow said germain eagerly as he separated from his companion rely on my prudence only that morning aware of the plot against germain which as far as he knew consisted merely in an intention of involving him in some affray which should compel the governor of the prison to remove him to some other yard in the building pique vinaigre was not only ignorant of the murderous designs so recently projected by the skeleton but equally so that the conspirators intended to avail themselves of his recital of gringalet and cut in half to deceive the vigilance of the officer on duty as well as to beguile his attention from what was going on come on old make-believe said nicolas to pique vinaigre as he advanced to meet him throw away that lump of dog's meat you have got in your hand we have got a regular feast among us and you are invited to it a feast la how nice what out of the panier fleuri or the petit raponneau tell us which it is but they are both such nice places there isn't a pin to choose oh you fool our feast is prepared in the day-room all laid out so temptingly on a bench there you'll see ham and eggs and cheese and it's my treat mind well i'm one of the right sort to walk into it but it seems a pity to throw away this good ration i have just received i only wish my poor sister and her children could have the benefit of it ah poor things it's not often they see meat unless indeed when they find a few scraps thrown out before the butcher's door oh bother about your sister and her brats let's go in or barbillon and the skeleton will leave nothing but empty trenchers for us nicolas and pique vinaigre entered together in the day-room where they found the skeleton sitting astride on the bench on which the savoury viands were displayed swearing and grumbling at the absence of the founder of the feast oh there you are you creeping animal exclaimed the ruffian as he caught sight of the story-teller what the deuce hindered you from bringing your blessed carcass here a little sooner he was spinning a yarn with germain when i found him answered nicolas helping himself to a large slice of ham ho ho cried the skeleton gazing earnestly on pique vinaigre without however diminishing the ardour with which he devoured the provisions so you were gossiping with germain were you yes i was returned pique vinaigre but what a fool that germain is i used to think that he was a sort of spy in the yard but lord love you he is too much of a simpleton for that 
oh you think so do you said the skeleton exchanging a rapid and significant glance with nicolas and barbillon i'm as sure of it as i am that i see a capital ham before me besides how the devil can he be a spy when he is always by himself he speaks to no one and nobody ever changes a word with him and you all know that he runs from us as if we carried the plague in our pockets now how a man can tell many tales who acts as he does is more than i can conceive however spy or not he will not be able to do us much harm as to to-morrow he will obtain a room for himself the deuce he will replied the skeleton then taking advantage of a conversation which had commenced between barbillon and pique vinaigre he leaned towards nicolas and said whisperingly you see we have not an instant to lose after four o'clock to-day all chance of serving him out is over it is now nearly three you see unfortunately he does not sleep in my dormitory or i would settle him in the night and to-morrow he will be out of our reach well i don't care answered nicolas as though replying to some observation of his companions i say and i'll stick to it germain always seems to look down upon us as though we were not as good as he no no interposed pique vinaigre you are quite wrong as regards this young man you are indeed you frighten him you do and i know that he considers himself not fit to hold a candle to you why if you only knew what he was saying to me just now let's hear what it was why says he you are a lucky fellow pique vinaigre you are he says to take the liberty of speaking to the celebrated skeleton that was the very word he used just for all the world as if you were his equal but whenever i meet him he says i feel myself overcome with so much awe and respect that though i would give my eyes out of my head to know him and converse with him i no more dare to do it than i should make bold to accost the prefet de police if he were in his chair of office and me beholding him body and bones he said that did he returned the skeleton feigning to believe the well-meant fiction of pique vinaigre as well as to feel gratified by the deep admiration he was reported to have excited in the breast of germain as true as you are the cleverest ruffian upon earth he said those very words and more than that he oh then if that is the case said the skeleton i shall make it up with him barbillon wanted to pick a quarrel with him but i shall advise him to be quiet that's right exclaimed pique vinaigre fully persuaded that he had effectually diverted from germain the danger that threatened him that would be much the best way for this poor chicken-hearted fellow would never quarrel simply because like me he has not pluck enough to fight therefore it is no use getting into a dispute still cried the skeleton i am sorry too that we shall not have our fun we had quite reckoned upon getting up a fight with germain to amuse us after dinner i don't know now what we shall do to kill the time ah to be sure chimed in nicolas what the deuce shall we do with ourselves can anybody tell me well then i'll settle it said barbillon since you seem to recommend my leaving germain alone i'll agree to do so on condition that pique vinaigre tells us one of his best stories done exclaimed the story-teller but i must make one condition as well as you and without both are agreed to i don't open my lips well then say what your condition is i dare say it is not more difficult than the former and we soon agreed about that it is that this honourable company which is overstocked with riches said the pique vinaigre resuming his old tone when addressing his audiences preparatory to commencing his juggling tricks will have the trifling kindness to club together and present me with a small sum of twenty sous a mere trifle gents when you are about to listen to the celebrated pique vinaigre who has had the honour of appearing before the most celebrated prigs of the day he who is now expected at brest or toulon by the special command of his majesty's government well then we'll stand the twenty sous after you have finished your story after no before said pique vinaigre what do you suppose us capable of doing you out of twenty sous asked the skeleton with an air of disdain by no means replied pique vinaigre i honour the stone jug with my confidence and it is in order to economise its purse that i ask for twenty sous in advance on your word and honour 
yes gentlemen for after my story you will be so satisfied that it is not twenty sous but twenty francs a hundred francs you will force me to take i know that i should be shabby enough to accept them and thus you see it is from consideration and you will do wisely to give me twenty sous in advance you don't want for the gift of the gab i have nothing but my tongue and i must make use of that and then if it must be told my sister and her children are in terrible distress and in a small house even twenty sous is a consideration then why doesn't your sister prig and her kids too if they're old enough asked nicolas don't ask me it distresses dishonours me i am too kind what do you mean you fool why you encourage her true i encourage her in the vice of being honest and that is the only line in which she shines but come it is agreed that i shall tell you my famous story of gringalet and cut in half but you must hand out twenty sous and barbillon shall not pick a quarrel with this simpleton of a germain well you shall have twenty sous and barbillon shall not pick a quarrel with that simpleton of a germain said the skeleton then open your ears and you will hear what you will hear but it is raining which will make the customers tumble in and there will be no occasion to go out and seek them and the rain began to fall and the prisoners quitting the yard took refuge in the day-room the turnkey being still in attendance we have said that this room was large and long with a pavement and lighted by three windows which looked out into the yard in the centre was the stove near which were the skeleton barbillon nicolas and pique vinaigre at a signal from the prévôt the gros boiteux joined this group germain was one of the last to enter absorbed in most delightful thoughts and he went mechanically to seat himself on the ledge at the lowest window in the apartment a place he usually occupied and which no one disputed with him for it was at a distance from the stove around which the prisoners were assembled we have already said that some fifteen of the prisoners had been informed in the first instance of the treachery attributed to germain and the murder which was to avenge it but soon whispered to one another the plan comprised as many adherents as there were prisoners these ruffians in their blind cruelty considering this fearful plot as legitimate revenge and viewing therein a certain guarantee against the future disclosure of spies germain pique vinaigre and the turnkey were alone ignorant of what was about to take place general attention was divided between the executioner the victim and the story-teller who was about innocently to deprive germain of the only succour he could hope for for it is nearly sure that the turnkey when he saw the prisoners attentive to the story of pique vinaigre would think his surveillance useless and take advantage of that moment of tranquillity to go and take his meal and when the prisoners had entered the skeleton said to the turnkey old fellow pique vinaigre has a capital idea he is going to tell us his story of gringalet and cut in half it is weather in which one would not put a policeman out of doors and we shall quietly wait in till it is time to go to roost why you are always pretty quiet when he begins his talk and i have no need for me to be at your heels yes said the skeleton but pique vinaigre asks a high price he wants twenty sous for his story yes the trifle of twenty sous a mere nothing cried pique vinaigre yes gents nothing for who that had a liar would not bestow it to hear the adventures of poor little gringalet cut in half and the wicked gargousse it will rend your hearts and make your hair stand on end and gents who is there that would not dispose of the paltry sum of four liars or if you prefer counting my mites of five centimes to have their hearts rent and their hair standing on end there are two sous said the skeleton throwing down the piece of money before pique vinaigre come is the stone jug too niggardly to enjoy this pastime he added looking at his accomplices with a significant air several sous fell around him to the great joy of pique vinaigre who thought of his sister as he collected the money eight nine ten eleven twelve thirteen he said as he picked up the money now my rich friends my capitalists and others of the cash interest try once more you cannot stop at thirteen for it is an unlucky number only seven sous deficient the trifle of seven sous what gents 
shall it be said that the fosse aux lions could not produce seven sous seven miserable sous oh gents gents you would make me believe that you have been brought here very unjustly or that you have all had a sad run of ill luck the shrill voice and broad jests of pique vinaigre had brought germain from his reverie and as much to follow rigolette's advice and make himself popular with the prisoners as to give a trifle to the poor devil who had testified some desire to be of service to him he rose and threw a piece of ten sous at the tale-teller's feet who exclaimed as he pointed at his generous benefactor ten sous gents you see i was speaking of capitalists honour to that gentleman he behaves like one of the moneyed interest as an ambassador to be agreeable to the company yes gents for it is to him that you will owe the greater portion of gringalet and cut in half and you will thank him for it as to the three sous over why i shall earn them by imitating the voices of the personages instead of speaking like you and me that will be another obligation you will owe to this wealthy capitalist whom you ought to adore come no more blarney but begin said the skeleton one moment gents said pique vinaigre it is but right that the capitalist who has given me ten sous should be the best situated except our prevot who has first choice this proposal squared so well with the skeleton's project that he exclaimed true after me he ought to be best placed and again he looked significantly at the prisoners yes yes let him come nearer said the prisoners let him sit on the front bench you see young man your liberality is recompensed the honourable company sees that you have a right to the front seat said pique vinaigre to germain believing that his liberality had really better disposed his hateful companions in his favour and delighted thus to follow up rigolette's earnest desires germain in spite of considerable repugnance left the place of his choice and went towards the story-teller who having arranged four or five benches around the stove by the aid of nicolas and berbillon said with emphasis here are the dress-boxes all respect to the worthy the capitalist first now then let those who have paid take their seats added pique vinaigre gaily firmly believing that thanks to himself germain had nothing now to fear and those who have not paid he added will sit down or stand up which they please let us sum up the arrangement of his scene pic vinaigre was standing up near the stove ready to commence near him was the skeleton also standing up and with his eyes intently fixed on germain ready to rush upon him the moment the turnkey left the cell at some distance from germain nicolas barbillon cardillac and other prisoners amongst whom was the man with the blue cotton nightcap and grey blouse occupying the remoter benches the majority of prisoners grouped here and there some sitting on the ground others standing and leaning against the wall composed the secondary figures of this picture lighted a la rembrandt by three lateral windows which threw strong light and deep shadows on forms so variously characterized and so strongly marked the turnkey whose departure was to be unknown to himself the signal for germain's murder kept close to the door which was ajar are we all ready asked pique vinaigre of the skeleton silence in the stone jug said the latter turning half around and then addressing pique vinaigre now begin we are all attention end of chapter ten read by celine major chapter eleven part one of the mysteries of paris volume five by eugene Sue this librivox recording is in the public domain gringalet and cut in half part one pic vinaigre began his recital thus in the midst of the profound silence of his auditory it is no inconsiderable time ago that the story occurred which i am about to relate to this honourable company what was called la petite pologne was not then destroyed the honourable society knows or does not know what was called la petite pologne well enough said the prisoner in the blue cap they were some small houses near the rue du rocher and the rue de la pepiniere exactly so my dear sir replied pique vinaigre and the quartier of the cite which at the same time does not consist of palaces would be in comparison to la petite pologne the rue de la paix or the rue de rivoli what a rookery 
but at the same time very convenient for gents in our line there were no streets but narrow alleys no houses but ruins no pavement but a small carpet of mud and dung heaps which would have destroyed all the noise of wheels that is supposing any carriages passed by that way but none did from morn till night and particularly from night till morn there were only cries of watch watch help murder but the watch took no notice the more persons were knocked on the head in la petite pologne the fewer persons there were to apprehend you should have seen the respectable inhabitants who lived there there were very few jewellers goldsmiths and bankers but then on the other hand there were quantities of organ-grinders puppet showmen punches and showers of remarkable animals amongst the latter was one well known as cut in half he was so cruel and especially to children he acquired this name because it was reported that he had cut a small savoyard in two with a blow of his hatchet at this moment the prison clock struck a quarter past three o'clock the prisoners being made to return to their cells at four o'clock the skeleton's murderous design must be carried into execution before that hour mille tonnerre the turnkey won't go he said in a low tone to gros boiteux be easy he'll go once the story is begun pique vinaigre continued no one knew where cut in half came from some said he was an italian others a bohemian others a turk others an african the gossips called him a magician although a magician in our times would be something to look at what made them believe this was that he always had with him a large red monkey called cargousse and who was so cunning and savage that he seemed as if possessed by the devil i shall mention this beauty again presently as to cut in half i shall soon describe him his complexion was like the old tops of a pair of jockey-boots his hair as red as the hair of his monkey his eyes green and what made the woman think he was a conjurer he had a black tongue a black tongue exclaimed barbillon black as ink replied pique vinaigre and how did that happen because no doubt when his mother was in the family way she had perhaps talked of a negro said pique vinaigre with modest assurance to these attractions cut in half joined the profession of having a multitude of tortoises monkeys guinea-pigs white mice foxes and marmosettes corresponding to an equivalent total of savoyard and forsaken children every morning he distributed his animal to each and a morsel of black bread and then dispatched them to beg for only one half penny or dance the caterina those who only brought in at night fifteen sous were beaten soundly beaten so that their shrieks might be heard from one end of la petite pologne to the other i should also say that there was in la petite pologne a man called le doyen the dean because he was the oldest inhabitant and as it were mayor provost magistrate for it was in his room he kept a tom and jerry shop that all went when they could not otherwise decide their quarrels although rather aged yet le doyen was as strong as hercules and very generally feared they swore by him in la petite cologne and when he said very good all the world said very good when he said that's bad all the world said that's bad he was a good fellow at bottom but very fierce particularly when the strong misused the weak then look out for squalls as he was cut in half's nearest neighbour he had heard the children cry very frequently from the blows which the shower of beasts gave them he had said to him if i hear the children cry i will make you cry in your turn and as you have the stronger voice i will give you the severer beating well done le doyen i like le doyen said the prisoner in the blue nightcap so do i added the turnkey as he approached the group the skeleton could not repress a movement of angry impatience pique vinaigre proceeded thanks to le doyen who had threatened cut in half the cries of the children were heard no more in the night-time in la petite pologne but the poor unhappy little fellows did not suffer the less for if they cried no longer when their master beat them it was because they were afraid of being more cruelly beaten 
as to complaining to le doyen they had no idea of that for the fifteen sous which each little fellow was obliged to bring in cut in half lodged boarded and clothed them in the evening a bit of black bread as at breakfast this was their food he never gave them clothes that was the way he clothed them and he shut them up all night with their animals on the same straw in a garret to which they mounted by a ladder and a trap this was the lodging when once all had ascended and the tale of children and animals was complete he took away the ladder and locked the trap you may judge of the life and row which these monkeys guinea-pigs foxes mice tortoises marmosets and children made all in the dark in this cock-loft which was as big as a barn cut in half slept in a room underneath with his great ape cargousse fastened to the foot of his bed when the brute growled because there was too much noise in the loft the beast shower went up the ladder without any light and going into the loft laid about him right and left with a heavy whip without seeing or counting his blows as there were always some fifteen children and some of the poor dears brought him in twenty sous a day cut in half having defrayed all his outlay which was by no means excessive had left for himself some four or five francs a day with which he enjoyed himself for it must be told that he was one of the greatest tipplers that ever lived and was regularly blind drunk once a day that was his rule and he declared that but for that he should have the headache every day we should add that out of his gains he used to buy some sheep's hearts for gargousse who ate raw flesh like a cannibal but i see the honourable society are anxious to be introduced to gringalet here he is gents let's have gringalet and i'll go and eat my soup said the turnkey the skeleton exchanged a look of savage satisfaction with the gros boiteux amongst the children to whom cut in half distributed his animals continued pic vinaigre was a poor little devil named gringalet without father or mother brother or sister without fire food or shelter he was alone in the world quite alone in a world which he had not asked to enter and which he might leave without attracting any one's attention he was not called gringalet for any pleasure he had in the name for he was meagre lean and pallid he did not look above seven or eight years old but was really thirteen if he did not seem more than half his name it was not because of his own will but because he only fed perhaps every other day and then so scantily so poorly that it was really an exertion to make him pass for seven years old poor little brat i think i see him said the prisoner in the blue cotton nightcap there are so many children like him on the streets of paris dying of hunger they must begin to learn that way of living very young in order to get accustomed to it said pic vinaigre with a bitter smile come on get on said the skeleton suddenly the turnkey is getting impatient his soup is getting cold oh never mind that said the surveillant i wish to know something more of gringalet it is very amusing yes it is really very interesting added germain who was very attentive to the story ah thank ye for saying that my capitalist said pic vinaigre that gives me more satisfaction than your ten sous piece tonnerre exclaimed the skeleton will you have done with your delays well then replied pic vinaigre one day cut in half had picked up gringalet in the streets dying with cold and hunger perhaps it would have been best if he had let him die as gringalet was weak he was a coward as he was a coward he became the jest and sport of the other lads who beat him and used him so ill that he would have become wicked if he had not been deficient in strength and courage but no when he had been heartily thumped he cried and said i have not done any harm to anybody and everybody is unkind to me that's very cruel oh if i were strong and bold you will perhaps imagine that gringalet was about to add i would return to others the ill they do to me by no means he said oh if i were strong and bold i would defend the weak against the strong for i am weak and the strong have made me suffer 
in the meanwhile as he was too small a boy to prevent the strong from ill-using the weak beginning with himself he prevented the larger brutes from eating the smaller ones what a strange idea said the prisoner in the blue cap and what is stranger still said the tale-teller it was this idea that consoled gringalet for being beaten which proves that his heart was not bad at bottom pardieu quite the contrary said the guardian what an amusing devil that pig vinaigre is at this instant the chimes went half past three o'clock the skeleton and gros boiteux exchanged significant glances the time was drawing on and the surveillant did not go and some of the less hardened prisoners seemed almost to forget the sinister projects of the skeleton against germain as they listened attentively to pic vinaigre's recital when i say he continued that gringalet prevented the larger brutes from eating the smaller you must understand that gringalet did not mix himself up with tigers and lions and wolves or even foxes and monkeys in the menagerie of cut in half he was too much of a coward for that but if he saw for instance a spider hidden in his web in wait for a poor foolish fly flying gaily in the sunshine of the good god without hurting any one why in a moment gringalet smashed the web freed the fly and did for the spider like a regular caesar a real caesar for he turned as white as a sheet in touching such nasty reptiles and then it required resolution in him who was afraid of a cockchafer and had been a long while in forming an intimacy with the tortoise which cut in half handed to him every morning thus gringalet overcoming the fear which the spider caused him in order to prevent flies from being eaten proved himself as plucky in his way as a man who attacks a wolf to take a lamb from his jaws said the prisoner in the blue cap or a man who would have attacked cut in half to take gringalet from his clutches added barbillon who was deeply interested as you say continued pig vinaigre so that after one of these onslaughts gringalet did not feel himself so unhappy he who never laughed smiled looked about him cocked his cap on one side when he had one and hummed the marseillaise with the air of a conqueror at this moment there was not a spider that dared to look him in the face another time it was a grasshopper which was swimming and struggling in a brook in a moment gringalet put his two fingers boldly in the water and rescued the grasshopper which he put on the grass a first-class swimmer who had fished up his tenth drowning man at fifty francs a head could not have been prouder than gringalet when he saw his grasshopper bend his legs and jump away and yet the grasshopper gave him neither money nor medal nor uttered any more thanks than did the fly but then pic vinaigre worthy friend the honourable company will say to me what the devil pleasure could gringalet whom all the world thumped and buffeted find in freeing grasshoppers and destroying spiders since people were unkind to him why did he not take his revenge by doing all the evil in his power for instance in giving spiders flies to eat leaving grasshoppers to drown or even drowning them on purpose yes why not why did he not revenge himself in that way asked nicolas what good would that have been inquired another why to do ill as ill was done to him no well then i understand he liked to save flies poor little chap said the man in the blue cap he said perhaps who knows if some day they mayn't save me in the same way my right worthy friend is right cried pic vinaigre and has read in his heart what i was about to narrate to the honourable assembly gringalet was not wicked he did not see beyond the end of his nose but he said cut in half is my spider and perhaps some day some one will do for me what i do for the other poor little flies break his web and take me from his clutches for till then nothing could have induced him to run away from his master he would as soon have thought of killing himself however one day when neither he nor his tortoise had had a chance and had not gained between either of them more than three sous cut in half beat the poor child very severely so severely that ma foi gringalet could not stand it any longer and tired of being the butt and martyr of everybody he watched a moment when the trap was open and whilst cut in half was feeding his animals he slid down the ladder 
oh so much the better said a prisoner but why didn't he go and complain to the doyen inquired the blue cap he would have served cut in half out yes but he dared not he was too much afraid and preferred trying to escape unfortunately cut in half had seen him and seizing him by the wrist lugged him up again into the loft poor gringalet thinking of what must befall him shuddered all over although he was by no means at the end of his troubles a propos of gringalet's troubles i must now mention to you gargousse the large and favourite ape of cut in half this mischievous brute was ma foi taller than gringalet only imagine what a size for a monkey i must tell you why he was never taken into the streets to be shown like the other animals of the menagerie it was because gargousse was so wicked and powerful that there was not one amongst all the show-boys except an auvernat of fourteen a determined chap who after many skirmishes and contests with gargousse had mastered him and could lead him about with a chain and even with him gargousse frequently got up some fights which ended in bloodshed produced by gargousse's bites enraged at this the little auvernat said one fine day very well i will revenge myself on this infernal monkey and so one morning having gone out with the brute as usual he in order to appease its savageness bought a sheep's heart whilst gargousse was eating it he put a rope through the end of his chain tied it to a tree and when he had got the brute quite at his mercy he gave it an outrageous walloping well done bravo the auvernat go it my lad skin the beast alive said the prisoners he did whack him gloriously continued pique vinaigre and you should have seen how gargousse cried ground his teeth leaped danced and skipped hither and thither but the auvernat used his stick famously unfortunately monkeys like cats are very tenacious of life gargousse was as crafty as he was vicious and when he saw as they say how the wood was on fire at a heavy blow he made a final bound and fell flat at the foot of a tree shook for a moment and then shammed dead lying as motionless as a log the auvernat believed he had done for him and thinking the ape dead he cut away resolved never again to return to cut in half but the beast gargousse watched him out of the corner of his eye and bruised and wounded as he was as soon as he saw himself alone he rent the cord asunder with his teeth the boulevard monceau where he had had this hiding was close to la petite pologne and the monkey knew his way as easy as his paternoster and making off in that direction arrived at his master's who roared and foamed when he saw how his monkey had been served this is not all from this moment gargousse entertained such a furious revenge against all children that cut in half who was not the tenderest soul alive dared not trust him to any one for fear of an accident for gargousse was capable of strangling or devouring a child and all the little brute showers knowing that would rather be thrashed by cut in half than go near the monkey i must really go and eat my soup said the turnkey turning towards the door this devil of a pic vinaigre would wheedle a bird down from a tree to hear him i can't tell where the deuce he fishes up all he tells now then the turnkey will go said the skeleton in a whisper to the gros boiteux i'm in such a rage i shake all over mind and form a wall all around the informer i will take care of the rest mind now and be good boys said the turnkey turning towards the door as good as images replied the skeleton coming closer to germain whilst the gros boiteux and nicolas after having agreed on a signal made two steps in the same direction ah oh, worthy turnkey you are going at the most interesting moment said pique vinaigre with an air of reproach had it not been for the gros boiteux who anticipated his intention and seized him suddenly by the arm the skeleton would have rushed on pique vinaigre what the most interesting moment replied the turnkey turning towards the story-teller decidedly said pique vinaigre you do not know all you will lose the most delightful portion of the history is now about to commence don't attend to him exclaimed the skeleton who with difficulty repressed his rage 
he is not in good trim to-day for my part i think his story very stupid my story very stupid cried pique vinaigre wounded in his pride as a tale-teller well turnkey i beg of you i entreat you to remain till the conclusion which at most will not be longer than a quarter of an hour and as by this time your soup must be cold why you haven't much to lose by a little delay i will go ahead with my narrative so that you may still have time to eat your soup before we are locked up for the night well then i'll stay but make haste said the turnkey coming closer towards him you are wise to stay turnkey continued pique vinaigre without bragging you never heard anything like it before especially the finale which is the triumph of the ape and gringalet escorted in procession by all the little beast showers and inhabitants of la petite pologne on my word and honour it is not for the sake of boasting but it is really superb then tell it speedily my boy said the turnkey returning towards the stove the skeleton shook with rage he almost despaired of accomplishing his crime if bedtime arrived germain must escape for he was not in the same dormitory with his implacable enemy and on the following day germain was to be in a separate cell so it's very stupid continued pique vinaigre well the honourable company shall be the judge of that there could not exist a more vicious brute than the big ape gargousse who was even more savage with children than his master what does cut in half do to punish gringalet for trying to run away you shall know by and by while in the meantime he seizes on the unhappy child and locks him into the cock-loft for the night saying to-morrow morning when all your companions are gone out i will let you see what i do with vagabonds who try to run away from me you may imagine what a wretched night gringalet passed he did not close an eye but kept asking himself what cut in half meant to do with him and then he fell asleep he had a dream such a horrid dream that is the beginning of it was as you shall see he dreamed that he was one of the very poor flies that he had so often rescued from the spider's webs and that he had fallen into a large and strong web where he was struggling struggling with all his might without being able to escape he then saw coming towards him stealthily and treacherously a kind of monster which looked like cut in half turned into a spider poor gringalet began to struggle again as you may suppose but the more he struggled the more he got entangled like the poor flies at last the spider came up to him touched him and he felt the cold and hairy paws of the horrid beast curl around him and enclose him intending to devour him he believed he was dead when suddenly he heard a kind of clear ringing sharp sort of buzzing and he saw a beautiful golden fly with a kind of brilliant dart like a diamond needle which flew around the spider with a furious air and a voice when i say a voice you must imagine a fly's voice which said poor little fly you have saved flies the spider shall not unfortunately gringalet jumped up at this moment and did not see the end of his dream but yet he was at first somewhat assured and said to himself perhaps the golden fly with the diamond dart would have killed the spider if i had finished the dream but in vain did gringalet endeavour to make himself easy and take comfort in proportion as the night ended his fears renewed so strongly that at last he forgot his dream or rather he only remembered the portion which affrighted him the large web in which he had been caught and enfolded by the spider which resembled cut in half you may imagine what a fright he was in only think only think alone quite alone and no one to defend him in the morning when he saw daybreak gradually appear through the skylight of the cock-loft his fears redoubled and the moment was at hand when he would be alone with cut in half he then threw himself on his knees in the middle of the garret and weeping bitterly entreated his comrades to ask cut in half to forgive him or else to help him to escape if possible but some from fear of their master others from disregard and some from ill-nature refused what poor gringalet requested so earnestly young scamps said the prisoner in the blue cap he is to be pitied so helpless 
if he could have defended himself tooth and nail it would have been very different ma foi if you have fangs show em boy and defend your tail to be sure said several prisoners hullo there exclaimed the skeleton unable to conceal his rage and addressing the blue cap won't you hold your jaw didn't i say silence in the stone jug am i captain of the ward or not the blue cap's answer was to look the skeleton full in the face and then make that low-lived gesture of the blackguards which consists in applying the thumb of the right hand to the end of the nose opening the fingers like a fan and putting the little finger on the thumb of the left hand similarly extended he accompanied this mute reply with so odd a look that many of the prisoners laughed heartily whilst others on the contrary were actually stupefied at the audacity of the new prisoner so greatly was the skeleton feared the latter shook his fist at the new prisoner and said to him grinding his teeth we'll settle this to-morrow i'll make the calculation on your knob i'll put down seventeen and carry nothing for fear the turnkey would have fresh motive for staying in order to repress any row the skeleton quietly replied that is not what i mean i am the captain of this room and ought to be attended to ought not i turnkey certainly replied the superintendent no interruption and go on pic vinaigre and make haste will you my lad end of chapter eleven part one read by celine major